Yeah. So, Darren, some history. Who are you? Where did you come from? What do you do? <laughs> <laughs> a lot of questions. Well, first, I, I just want to say Gavin's footage is fantastic. I mean, I've never seen it, and it's incredible. Yeah, no, now, I don't, I don't want to show anything that I do. <laughs> um, I'm, I grew up in L.A. I was uh, pretty much self-taught mm -hmm. since I was a teenager. Mm -hmm. Just started from learning about photography and the basics, and then just kept working my way up. I uh, knew nobody in the business, so everything was just hands-on. Mm -hmm. And I had to learn how to do a lot of things myself. Um, then I broke into doing commercials uh, on my way because I always wanted to do, to do features. Mm -hmm. uh, did aerials, did everything, and then finally started um, getting, getting into features from smaller ones with smaller budgets, which were great because you can be really creative with right. it and then moving into larger budgets and everything else in between. Uh, and you also work on the SciTech, the Academy SciTech Council? Yeah, I was yeah. on the Academy SciTech Council for uh, about 10 years, starting in the, the early 2000s when it was uh, reformed. So, uh, not, not reformed reformed, but reformed <laughs> as a group. Uh, so some of the projects that came through that were yeah. ACES and things like that that right. we talked about, what could we do to to contribute back into right. this new digital area mm -hmm. era, and you know, we had no idea digital cinematography was going to get this fa this good this fast. Right. So you've used a number of different cameras, obviously film going right. back, in, uh, and and as the cameras progressed, you you then started using the 55s and 65s. You you've shot a number of projects, uh, Let's Be Cops, Dolphin Tale 2. Uh, tell us, tell us uh, about those experiences. Well, I, I was lucky because I, I was able to stay on film for a long time. I used 5219 a lot. I knew what it could do. I knew that I could take the cameras and just run and gun if I had to or do an incredibly beautiful um, sort of large scale setup, visual effects. It, it, was, it was just a solid, solid piece to create with. So luckily I didn't have to make the transition. Mm -hmm. um, I the first camera I I looked at a lot of the cameras and there were, you know, there were uh, about four years ago and there were give and takes with them, yeah. you know, but nothing's ever perfect. Right. Uh, if you can figure out what you like about one, it just might be the right thing for one project or another. But there was nothing I saw that I felt was as versatile as having a film camera right. until I got my hands on uh, one of the, the working prototypes of the F-65. Uh, to me, I come from a fil you know, you know, film world, so that camera, you know, there were smaller cameras, but that camera was felt like a solid camera. It felt it was the same, you know, not any bigger than a Panaflex, which we thought was a really, you know, nicely sized camera. Uh, and, but there's a solidness to it. The rotating shutter was beautiful at motion. It was it, it just looked so filmic. Uh, but when I started just running it through its paces, and this is just really informal, you know, pointing it at things you're not supposed to point at, like the sun <laughs> and trees and everything, I, I was surprised. I thought there was something else here that hadn't been seen before, and then that pursued me to, to start to now formally try to figure out how to use the camera. So what are you looking for when you test the camera? Do obviously dynamic range, color gamut, signal to noise, give us some... Well, signal to noise, I mean, yeah, that's, those are numbers that f cinematographers, I don't know <laughs> signal to noise, I, I know broadcast. Right. I just look at it and know when it, it looks good, when, when it looks solid, when the blacks don't look like they're crawling with artifacts and things then uh, then you know it's a you know you can dig right down into it uh, but I, I shoot a lot of tests to fail I want to see where the camera fails and that's right. the same thing I used to do with film I'll push the camera to a point where okay I don't want to go there because everything we do in cinematography is being consistent to a certain point, but you've got to be you've got to be able to explore. You've got to be able to push the boundaries every time there's a, a new story that comes about. Right. And the 55, you've you tested that and used that on a on a few films, on a few yeah, projects. Yeah, um, I had I had about a year and a half, I think, of using the F65 and was very very happy with the results. The 55 came along, and um, there were I knew this is one of the rare cases where I knew about 
two months in advance I was going to start this this movie for Fox called Let's Be Cops. Mm -hmm. And uh, the idea of the movie visually was it starts off with a very naturalistic look trying to get the audience to to see these two characters, you know, in, in a very depressing situation. And then it stylizes itself to almost, you know, an action movie scenario. So there was going to be a lot of looks combined in there. And the camera, I knew I needed a smaller camera, but yet I didn't want to give up the F-65s. Right, right. So, uh, I so you, you, mixed, you mixed the camera? I mixed the two, oh, yeah. Okay. I kept the F-65, but uh, augmented it with three F-55s. Okay. And luckily in that two months time, I was on another project, but I was able to get enough accessories, things built to make it do what I needed it to do in the field. Right, and then uh, with Dolphin Tail 2, you, it, was that a mixture of 65, 55 as well, or primarily? That, that was. Um, those two movies almost ended up back to back. So I was able to, uh, to take essentially the same bodies and the same knowledge and make improvements to what I did and what my crew did with the uh, F-55, apply it to Dolphin Tail because that was going to be a movie where it was extreme, bright sunlight, a lot of mixed color, right. um, and we had to make it all flow into a story. It, it, it couldn't be shot like a children's film. It, right. had to, it had to have that emotional pull to it. Right. All right, so we have a clip. Uh, a clip here of the uh, underwater, I think, right? It's an underwater yeah. clip. Now, yeah, what these clips are are things that haven't been seen. And there were there were some initial sort of tests, but um, one of the interesting things with the F fifty five, which was totally unexpected, is that in underwater and mixed light, I always knew mixed light it was beautiful, yeah. both cameras, which shows that expanded color gamut, expanded dynamic range means something even though you're not using all of it they contribute to the, the chunk of what you want to see visually so I actually have not seen these projected okay. I mean they, they're, they came straight from a 4k raw file and I just put it through the Sony viewer so you can take all a right. look and I can talk about all right. why so I think it's interesting Terry can you roll the first clip let's take a look and we can talk our way through it right so what are we seeing here? Okay, so this this is straight underwater. Usually underwater, you can as you can see how much dynamic range the camera has. Um, all the effects on the dolphin is not just white reflections, but you're seeing the prismatic colors in that. Um, it's natural daylight. Uh, even though there's a lot of blue reflected naturally because uh, the color spectrum changes, there's separate. I mean, you know, it's a gray dolphin. Yeah. There's not a lot of cameras uh, that I know of that you can be in such a mixed, varied, harsh lighting situation and come up with images like. I mean, this isn't time. I mean, this is one light through the Sony. There's no dynamic things. Here you can see as the dolphin goes do down darker. Of course, naturally be bluer. But we found that if we wanted it to look like this, it's great. We were able to make it brighter, darker. As it comes to the surface, all the color, the whole color spectrum is shifting, as you can see right now. Um, but that's something that even the underwater camera operators I had had never seen anything like this working that way. But that's that's where it's, it's interesting because you know you can look at a lot of a lot of your you know setups like we conventionally do and see that yeah the camera looks great here looks great here put it in sort of a singular situation that you can't control these other elements and the camera it was just delivering every time for us um, we thought we were gonna have to try to massively do some kind of correction to make the underwater work look like something you don't you didn't get tired of instead the variance being able to have your subject travel between different color gamuts in there was uh was something that just made it get, it gave it another direct dimension it was great so talk about the the 16-bit raw and how uh, how th how the 16-bit capability of the raw with the ultra wide color gamut you're going through post-production right. you're working in in open exr asus yeah talk us through that process Okay, uh, well, one of the things with shooting uh, a movie like this with these kind of images is 
is that you, you really need, if the camera has the capability of capturing a white color gamut, if you don't have a way of recording it and bringing it back into post, it's just thrown away. It has to clip it. It has to get rid of data. It has to get rid of the information. So we made a, so that isn't dolphin tail. But <laughs> yeah, we're just cycling through let, you. Let, yeah, let's be two cops. projects. But we 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 made an early decision. I talked to the producers. I talked to really important the visual effects supervisor about I want to I want to finish this movie in sixteen. You know, have the intermediate format be sixteen bit Open EXR. We'll use you know the principles of Aces in here, and. His effects budget was really small. He was using a lot of small vendors located around the world and in Toronto. Um, so it was going to be talking them through it. But the reason why I wanted to do that and keep the 16 bits that the camera was putting out was because I can take advantage of the wide dynamic range within that image to do more, a more natural color correction to it more like what you would do with film by adjusting the exposure and everything falls into place. And even color, the colors would never start to, even though they, there may be a prominent color, they always had dimension to it. They always had different variances within it. It wasn't just a, a turquoise blue. It was a turquoise blue that had a little magenta. It was everything that you would see with your eye, which made the whole post process much, much easier to do. Because if, you know, if we were out doing this kind of thing, you can't predict what reflections you're going to get off the water, but you want that snap. I, I didn't want to avoid the things that they say you should not shoot on digital. And um, you know, scenes like this, it, I just shot it lighting it by eye and just went for it, and the cameras delivered. You know, And doing the 16-bit aces kept it so that all that information was available to me in the color timing so that we can craft it then. When visual effects came in, what was really good with that is that they delivered them with more, with all the information we gave them, plus whatever they added, if they were taken out a telephone pole or something. So I was able to then take that image and very easily mold it into intercutting it with the scene there. Even though if they had their color ideas entirely wrong from what we had in the scene, because we're all separated and we give them guide clips, but yet things change with an edit. Um, that that made them really happy. When they saw, when the visual effects supervisor, when we got to the very end and saw the um, premiere of the movie, uh, digitally projected, and he was amazed at how well his work had cut in at the end because he was out in the field with the, you know, with the visual effects vendors. But we were able to just match it do also do matching on different types of weather situations right. uh, like you can see here I mean we wanted this to be you know seems to be have like a sunsetty glow when but we had to extend that of course the light changes you change the things you know what you can light with your per, you know your actors but you right. try to do the wide shots when when nature gives it to you mm -hmm. uh, what we were able to do with the cameras change is it was such a uh, wide gamut and dynamic range, we were able to just move it a little bit so that our contrast and everything felt the same. All right, I think we have a second clip here that we can roll, uh, a it's second underwater clip, right? That yeah, we, that it's Terry more sort of experimental with the 4K, you know, 4K underwater. Okay. What underwater housing were you using? We, we were able to, this is a real short one, but you can see the difference here without any secondary crazy color correction or contrast, yeah. you can see that there is, you know, there's blue underneath, but you're getting these other color differences. I should have made it longer. The yeah. bubbles are incredible in 4K. Yeah. We but have, um, we yeah, the, the underwater housing, yeah. we knew, uh, the underwater housing had to be very nimble. The other part of it is that these are the two real dolphins at Clearwater Marine Aquarium that were, that are, were saved and can't be released because they don't know how to hunt for food. Um, if anything happened to those dolphins, it would be totally game over. Uh, one of them will winter. The one that they that was in the first movie is in this, and you know they made the prosthetic tail. If anything, you know we wanted to keep the dolphins completely safe, which meant our housing, whatever we put in the water, we were very conscious of. It had to have smooth edges. Um, we didn't want a lot of protruding things. 
because they're curious. They'll swim up to the camera and they'll check it out first before they decide to uh, to act. Um, so talk, talk to me about the LUTs. What what LUTs did you develop for the for the two films? I mean, we can go back and forth here between Let's Be Cops and Dolphin Tale 2, but how did you arrive at the LUTs, the look you wanted to achieve? You discussed it with the director, I guess. And yeah, the, I mean, the director of Dolphin Tale was Charles Martin Smith, who is an actor also. He was in American Graffiti. He starred in Never Cry Wolf. Really big as far as knowing, you know, wanting a very natural look. But um, he wanted, you know, he, wa he wanted to shoot it in film. And we knew we couldn't get to that point with as much that was going on in the logistics of it. So basically we stuck with a, a pretty natural uh, filmic look to it, but we were going to push it in lighting, coloring the light so it felt like it was late afternoon, um, underexposing things just so we could get it, you know, get scenes to have that mood because you can have the actors say the lines and give a performance, but you've got to get the audience to believe and want to look at what's happening there. And that, and, and that way, these, they they absorb that story. Hopefully, right. I mean that's that's like our job as cinematographers. Um, so the LUT, it's no, there was no magic LUT thing to it okay. because we we're following the Aces rules. Uh, Bringing it, you know, bringing in what we saw as sort of the profile of the camera, having it normalized to a point, and then using there was we had one base sort of aces um, transform that took it so we could look at at 709 on the set okay. because most of them all the monitors were right. 709. And frankly, I don't. I don't, I'm so confident with the cameras, I don't sit in a black tent. Right. I'll just set the exposure by eye. Right. I'll look at the monitor once in a while, but I knew that um, it would be like film dailies. You had this great range even in dailies when you're doing it within an ACES type of system. Right. Uh, we had a separate setup for the F55 and, and then a separate one for the F65, right. pretty much the same. Mm -hmm. But it, it meant that uh, from there, I, ha I had a, luckily I had a Daly's Colorist on location in Clearwater mm. and we set up a room, a small little room at the production office with a 2K projector. Oh, right. uh, we're using um, Technicolor's uh, Frame Logic, which is based on Colorfront. Mm. And I insisted that everything, all the deliverables be done straight from the raw file. So we had enough speed in the RAID, we had a 40 terabyte RAID. Mm. We had enough speed in it so we can ingest the material quickly. It, it became our lab on site. Mm. The, the colorist, the dailies colorist, would get our footage. He'd come in at about 2, 2 a.m. once the ingests were done for the day. Right. He just did, he would look at our aces, the base aces uh, uh, display that we're using, and then look at my notes. And just like in film, you know, he, was, he had the script right there. You know, he knew where I wanted to take it. And uh, we would come in, our, our process was then we would come in after shooting around seven o'clock mm -hmm. and we project dailies, you know, on a screen like this. Right. And we projected it straight because the raw, the structure of the raw was so, we, we could play it at real time. Right. We played back the raw, we didn't, we wouldn't have time to make a dailies file. We played back the raw straight through the color front with the corrections he made and watched it live. That way, when we decided, oh, let's just jump to this other piece, let's look at that. Oh, we're running out of time, let's look at this last close-up. But it gave all the, the uh, crew, the, you know, the director, the producer, the, my gaffer, a grip, you know, the focus pullers, and the art department, you know, the costumes, makeup, everybody came to dailies. And we all watched everything and they, adjusted their work to be better mm. because they could see it bigger and with wider mm. uh, color gamut. Mm. So that made a, that made a, big, a, a big, big difference. So talk to me about 4K. You, obviously you shot it in 4K. What, what does 4K bring to the table for well, motion picture? You know, four, 4K brings to the table, you know, there's, there's more detail. I mean, Dolphin Tail, Dolphin Tail 2, we didn't finish in 4K because it was because of the bandwidth and posts and you were going to run up against. Uh, we, 
I made the choice to shoot it in 4K, but use that 4K as a super sample RAW file and bring it into 2K. Right. And then it, the trade-off was, let me finish it in 16-bit ACES. Mm -hmm. So I had to expand the, I was gonna expand the bandwidth in post one way, but I picked that because I knew I could do the 4K very easily. But we still use the editors, some of the editors now did some blow-ups on certain shots. Those I had rendered at 4K. Mm -hmm. And that, that was something the editors had no idea they could do. They were looking at, right. uh, you know, their avid saying, "Oh, we can't go this far." And then I'd say, "I'm going to order up a, we'll order it up as a 4K shot, right. 4K render, and right. do it that way." Right. So the the super sampling down to 2K gives you a better 2K from the 4K sensor right. than a right. than a standard 2K camera, right? Absolutely. Um, it, it's it's uh, the, the thinking is sort of uh, like you're not straining every pixel. It's in film you have much more color gamut, much more resolution than you really need, but all of that contributes to what you select in your creative intent, and that's how I've I've looked at it before when I used the F65 on Made in Jersey, which was the first series that had shot with that camera, and. Uh, I compared just recording HD out and then recording it to, um, uh, I did the SR Lite to be kind to post-production. Right. And the difference was, yeah, the HD looked great. The, the S, the 4K um, down converted to HD looked spectacular. It had a three-dimensional quality to it and you could see it on the air. Um, it just made it made that one-dimensional sort of HD plane feel like there were several textures and colors going on. Oh. So, all right, Terry, do we have another clip we can roll here? I think we had three, right? Three yeah, clips. Yeah, I mean, they're all these raw things I just pulled off of. Yeah, uh, let's take a look, yeah, uh, so see what we can roll here. All right. So this is a. Uh, it was actually an experiment that when I shot this, it's at 60 frames in the water. I couldn't resist. I had to light it. Yeah. But at these things here are, we they we they had them. Uh, we gave them an opportunity to install these jets, sort of like an underwater treadmill. Right. It's never been done before, but the thinking here was that uh, we were done with production. Mm. Um, as a favor to the aquarium, I said they wanted to test this to see if they could train a dolphin to run in a column of you know to swim in a column of water. Mm. And that way, well, dolphins like these that are hurt, that can't get out in the wild, could maybe get real exercise. Right. And um, mm -hmm. that image in 4K um, was just the start to this whole kind of process that Clearwater Marine Aquarium is doing, so much so that the University of Florida asked me if I can come back down there, shoot more stuff in 4K, so they can, they found that with the 4K and the color and everything else that's going on, they can really analyze how that animal is swimming. If it's swimming like it's in a tank or in the wild, and if they make that work, it'll ref, you know, just revolutionize all these conservation uh, efforts for the hurt, the hurt marine animals. You know, right? All so right. It, yeah, it's it's fun when. You do something for as a you know for a movie, right, but it's and you can actually affect real yeah. life. It's great. Yeah, absolutely. So t I'm just talking to my tech guy backstage, Terry. If you can re-roll the longer clip of the dolphin that we had a little earlier, and then uh, we can take some questions while we're rolling that clip. Thank you. All right. So any questions for Darren and from the audience, and then we can switch to online to see if we have some questions online. Okay, so we have one question from our social media. Shooting films for kids versus shooting films for adults. Uh, I think they want to have some comparisons and how does that dynamic work on location? Um, uh, shooting or, or shooting, it must, they must uh, be shooting with kids. Maybe it's shooting with kids. It's yeah, let's, mainly, let's go it with that. It has nothing to do with me. It's mainly a language thing. <laughs> um, but, y you know, these way... When you're making a movie with kids, it's it was just, it was the same as making them with animals. You want to keep a calm, respective mood on the set. It's pretty easy because my you know the, the sets that I ha I run, we we have a good time. We have a lot of laughs. There's uh, you know, and it makes us work harder at it. But 
as far as a visual standpoint, I don't shoot a movie that's going to be rated PG any different than what a movie rated R is going to be because whatever you do, it has to apply to the story. And I found that the audiences, kids, they're so sophisticated that uh, yeah. you need to give them a dynamic adult image. That's what they want to look at. So. All right, great. Any other questions for Darren? Anything online, Allison? Yeah. Okay, what has been your favorite project to shoot? Favorite pro? Well, I, right now it's got to be Dolphin Tale 2. Right. Uh, we were able to, you know, because of the cameras, we were able to, to take what we saw on the script in our mind a and actually put it up on the screen. And it's affected a lot of people. It, it's brought a lot of consciousness to this, so. Uh, especially with all the controversies with these other places. Right, I mean, the, right. the conservation efforts are real. Right. And we were able to, to, to show, I think we were able to show these animals in a whole different sense that you get their personalities. They absolutely have personalities. Right. Uh, and it gets people to care about a whole other aspect of the world there. Right. All right. Yep. We have one question from you. No, I didn't. Actually, you know, sorry, I, re repeat yeah, the question. Uh, it's and then the, uh, the high key, low key function uh, viewing, right? Yeah. I, I didn't because, uh, one, I, I, I treated it like when I did, do, did film testing and would just know by looking at it with my eye what the range was. I, I tried it a couple of times, but I couldn't make it into a habit because I wanted to give the operators more time to sit on the cameras than myself. Although in Dolphin Tail, I did all the techno crane work myself because there was no rehearsal. It was happening live. I had to figure out how to make these elegant shots that were corresponding with the dialogue. I would have a comm tech in my ear, listen to the dialogue, watch everything, and say, oh, this moment's going to happen, and be coming down with the crane and getting very low to the water. So a lot of that, there were my poor assistants had no marks. <laughs> But that was the only way you could you could do that in that sense, you know, unless it was a total, unless it was a CG dolphin. But for exposure, I it, it was very easy to get a sense when you're shooting shooting raw with the with an S log, uh, you know, with these cameras, it's very easy to get a sense of where you need to be. If I had something that was really questionable, some really hot highlight somewhere, or if I knew if I knew in post we were going to dig out something. Then I would check it sort of on a waveform because I had had one I could go look at. But again, because I wasn't working in a black tent, I, I just felt that that isolates you. Um, working with these cameras and knowing the wide latitude and wide color gamut, it's, it, it's great because it got me to be right on the set with everybody. And, and in that sense, you get the mood and the vibe and it makes you light and do things differently. When you're kind of isolated, only concentrating on the picture, that's uh, that takes you away from that whole emotional, you know, group effort that's going on. So, real quick, what lenses did you use? What lenses were used here, and then these were above these water? were all pa all Panavision lenses, okay. Panavision Primos, and uh, I picked them because I knew the lenses really well. I knew what you know what they, their capabilities were, mm -hmm. what the um, what where if I pointed it and wanted a flare, I knew what that flare was going to look like. Because a, a lot of times I, I want to get those things that make it feel like it's life. You know, it just, it just sort of happened. Right. Um, so I stuck with that, but I, I have tested the, Panavision has a new series of lenses called V, Primo Vs that are made just for digital cameras. And I tested one on an F55 and it, it, was, it was stunning. Um, in the sense that it wasn't all about resolution, it had the resolution, but it held contrast, and it was made, it was made with a digital sensor in mind, not where these lenses were made with film yeah, emotion. Because film emotion, it, basically, it's sort of, I, I think of it as a soft sensor, um, whereas a digital sensor, it's shiny, it's right there. Uh, so it really, it really made the cameras, you know, I could really see even more of what the cameras were capable of. All right, that's fantastic. All right, really thank you for coming today, Darren. Oh, my, my great, pleasure. Great you session. Know.
All right. Darren O'Carter, ASC, ladies and gentlemen. Thank, thank all of you guys. All right. Thank everybody for watching. Thank you.